The court has gone to the extent of saying that only if a court is convinced that this person, the accused, is beyond the reformation, then alone this can be awarded. And how do you arrive at such a conclusion? Welcome to another episode of the 39A podcast. This is Anoop Surendranath from Project 39A and we are an extensive criminal justice program based out of National Law University, Delhi. In this episode, we are in conversation with Justice Kurian Joseph, former judge of the Supreme Court of India between March 2013 and November 2018. Justice Joseph was also a judge in the High Courts of Kerala and Himachal Pradesh between July 2000 and March 2013. In today's conversation, we will use the last judgment that Justice Joseph delivered as a judge of the Supreme Court to reflect on the administration of the death penalty in India. Justice Joseph, thank you very much for your time and welcome to the 39A podcast. Thank you. Justice Joseph, I want to start with um, Channulal versus State of Chhattisgarh, which was your last judgment in the Supreme Court, and you delivered a partial dissent calling for the reconsideration of the death penalty in India. Uh, in that you were particularly concerned uh, with the arbitrariness in death penalty sentencing. And a thought that occurred to me and what I wanted to ask was, are you of the view that arbitrariness is inherent to death penalty sentencing, irrespective of what changes we might make to the sentencing framework? Uh, That is my view as well. But I can trace this view from the judgments of the Supreme Court. After Bachchan Singh, if you see a series of uh, judgments dealing with uh, the aggravating and mitigating circumstances, the way the court has cautioned the trial judges and the High Court and Supreme Court itself that we should be uh, doubly sure that we do not fall into this uh, trap of being arbitrary in sentencing the person for a death penalty. So that was, I I also had uh, my independent thinking into it because there is no consistency. It was depending on the person to person, the culture which the judge comes from, the place which the judge comes from, the the exposure the judge had into the academics part of uh, the sentencing um, and his sensitivity, all several aspects I've seen. For example, you just uh, take uh, Justice Krishnayar. Justice Krishna introduced poverty as one of the mitigating factors. I tried to introduce uh, the, the, the youthhood of a person as uh, one of the mitigating factors. So the jurisprudence has been growing more in favor of uh, the mitigating circumstances than the aggravating. But, but do you think that this arbitrariness and inconsistency is solvable or do you think that's uh, a, a problem that we cannot solve really and it is inherent to this exercise. So after all, a judge is a human being. You can't deny that fact. Just as the victim is a human being, just as the perpetrator is a human being, so to the judge, so to the prosecutor. So there are something inherent in all human beings that uh, you cannot uh, uh, provide absolute scientific data so as to perfectly fall into a particular uh, Uh, position or an inference that it is absolute, that there is no other way and this is the only way. We call it, we have been trying to take it as the rarest of rarest. Even this rarest of rarest has again gone into a finer uh, positions now that it may not be any other punishment uh, would not be suitable also. So there are several aspects which the court has been, in a way, a, a sensitive judiciary has been struggling to introduce the new jurisprudence in favor of life of the person, in favor of saving the life of a person. Another concern that you raised in Chanulal about how the death penalty is administered and adjudicated was the role of public opinion in death penalty cases. Um, Is the judicial invocation of notions like the collective conscience in death penalty judgments contrary to the very foundations of the rule of law? And in the in in the sense that uh, what I'm asking is the use of collective conscience. uh, Does it come very close to adjudication by what people want, 
rather than what the law demands and then it's and that it's in some sense deferring to uh, demands of the people rather than the law what we see in today's world is not the well informed opinion formed by the public having regard to entire aspects of the matter then alone it becomes a, a, a conscious decision a conscious opinion today i am only referring to the situation that what we see is today is not a, an informed formation of a conscious opinion by the public what we see today is a public opinion it is not necessarily well informed in the sense people may not know the defenses available to the accused people may not know the legal position people may not know what evidence the prosecution is in a position to adduce before the court people may not know that the court can only go by the evidence and come to a conclusion that beyond reasonable doubt this person and this person alone has uh, committed an offence so these are not available to the public when they form an opinion whereas if they had been in a position to understand all this legal system and legal positions then it would have been an informed opinion of the public only an informed opinion of the public can be called a public consciousness but uh, unfortunately what the media today does is not an informed opinion of the public but a ill informed opinion of the public because they want a rating of their paper they want a rating of their media they want a rating of their um, social media also whatever it is so they 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 always tap on the ill informed position of the public so that the public gathers opinion that is not the public consciousness so that is one thing secondly see a judge or a jury or a system judicial system cannot go on public opinion or even public consciousness public consciousness however um, informed may it be even then what is its evidentiary value before the court and how far that opinion can be taken as an evidence this way or that way is yet to be seen by the court in the adjudicatory system so we have a well established system of law a procedure law and a substantive law so that the facts or the, um, the the figures or the data or the evidence whatever it is is actually seen by the court and uh, the judge finally takes a decision as to what evidence can be relied what cannot be relied what is admissible what is inadmissible because we have this uh, evidence act on the admissibility of evidence we have the procedural law because uh, criminal procedure we have uh, of course the penal law the interpenal court so all these three things come into play before a court whereas these three things do not come into play before the public when they form an opinion be it a conscious decision also so that is difference even if academicians uh, take a decision or form an opinion also that may not as such uh, be uh, binding or even shall not be a persuasive value also on the court because court has to see what the people said about it but court has to see what can be seen in law before it in respect of the particular accused person and the crime which is uh, accused against him so it is very unsafe to go by the public opinion but having said that i have to add one thing more so look at the plight of um, a poor sessions judge in the trial side one side he has the, the the public has already formed opinion about the conclusive um, situation whereby a particular person has committed the crime so the trial is over in the mind of the public a picture has been drawn already and established they have established that the crime has been committed and he is the person who committed the crime there's another aspect of it also see there's look at the situation of a trial judge before he goes to the trial a trial has already been conducted by the media and they have established that a crime has been committed by a particular person or a group of persons and they are being tried by the court secondly even the police who are part of the investigation they also conduct a press conference as part of their investigation 
are showing before the public that these are the accused who have committed the crime and these poor victims you know, sometimes uh, we see you know they have covering their face you know helplessly trying to show to the people that they are not the persons but they have been actually trapped or they have been they are otherwise innocent this is the only way they can show before the public that they don't want to show their identity that is one person so when the court uh, is actually trying the case there's a particular background among the society and thirdly even when the trial is going on also there's a new trend of uh, the public demanding the punishment ultimate punishment of the accused even before the trial has started which we have seen in delhi also in couple of cases there's a public agitation outside the court when the trial was going on so this is the pressure on which uh, a trial judge uh, conducts the trial i used to say if uh, the judge does not uh, grant uh, the punishment the public is demanding probably the public will impose the punishment on the judge when he comes out such is the pressure but with all that a judge assumes office taking a solemn pledge that he will discharge his duties without fear or favor affection or ill so he doesn't have to fear the public opinion he doesn't have to favor the public opinion he will have to take an unbiased decision this is theory but in practice i have to say there is some pressure uh, being uh, created by this sort of a media trial on the public because a judge is also a person belonging to the public you you said that judges are also human beings are you then concerned that public consciousness or public opinion seeps into all levels of the judiciary in in the context of adjudicating crime and it's not just the sessions judge are you concerned that it that seeps in rather uncomfortably at all levels yeah when i said the judge is also a human being i said theoretically or ideally we can say he should be above all this but as a human being some involuntary process of his human nature will permit something to creep in and the maturity of a judge or the capacity of a judge is to get above all those things and then show that he is an independent judge in an independent judiciary doing an independent exercise but you're saying it's a massive struggle it's a matter of great struggle a very common argument uh, justice joseph that we hear in support of the death penalty is that you know if we keep the death penalty it might even prevent one person from committing a crime and if it prevents even that one person then it's worth it uh if it achieves even that amount of deterrence it's worth it uh, what do you think of that argument yeah you can say ideally it is right but uh, if we analyze uh, the crime record of our own country forget about other countries i don't think that we have any substantial proof to hold that the deterrence has actually served its purpose if that were the situation how many uh, capital punishments we have executed such crimes would not have been repeated but such crimes are simply being repeated also so deterrence has not gone into the mind of the people in changing their attitude towards commission of uh, the crime and the people in the sense the accused or such people so to me i feel is unsafe to rely on the deterrence theory of punishment at least as far as capital punishment is concerned does it show just joseph that we have a rather simplistic understanding of the relationship between crime and punishment in the sense that we seem to think that harsher and harsher punishments will stop crime but isn't the reality that crime is a much more complex social phenomenon and that reduction in crime in society requires a very different approach to it i 100% agree with you this uh, punishment alone will not solve the recurrence of a crime in society it needs of lot of um, societal corrections that's one thing secondly to me having executed a person the society forgets the whole event but whereas if a person is kept uh, behind the bars 
that will send a stronger message that if you indulge in this sort of a crime you will be like the one who is inside there because after execution it's over but he is a living deterrence the person in jail is a living deterrence than the person who has been executed for his uh, crime there have been many instances of brutal sexual violence and acts of terrorism uh, that have caused a lot of alarm in our society clearly uh, many would argue that it is legitimate for society for us to collectively pursue some sort of revenge for those actions so it's not about deterrence let's leave deterrence aside this is about society wanting a certain kind of revenge isn't there a democratic conundrum there that if if society wants it it should be able to pursue that and uh, who is anybody to stop that well retribution as a punishment does not go with uh, the purest form of democratic uh, principles retribution is the old theory of uh, eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand in some countries even such a punishments are even even now uh, in practice but that will not go with uh, democracy in democracy the approach on prevention of crime or control of crime is totally different it's not uh, a retribution so if uh, somebody has taken my life or my my sons or my 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 relatives life then the only way appropriate punishment will be to take away that person's life that is not uh, the unfortunately unfortunately and rather fortunately yes fortunately that is not the way the crime and punishment uh, have to be approached because uh, one will have to understand the circumstances which led to the commission of crime which uh, one will have to go to the nuances of the crime one will have to go to the repercussions the crime had on the society one will have to see the background of the criminal and uh, the circumstances of aggravation or mitigation so all these are several aspects to be seen if we concentrate only on the crime aspect alone then these considerations will not be there so our democracy believes in rule of law so law enjoins a right on the criminal to establish before court these several aspects which will give him a protection in from being awarded the worst punishment so very often victims rights are presented against rights of the accused as though we can protect victims better if we reduce keep reducing the rights of defendants but don't you think that somebody who suffers a crime and somebody who also perpetrates a crime are both indicative of state and social failure certainly i agree with you for me i would like to approach also the issue which you pose in a different angle as far as victim is concerned more than the rights of the victim the state should concentrate and the society should concentrate on rehabilitation of the victim or rehabilitation of the members of the family of the victim and the accused is concerned law demands that the system should uh, actually think about reforming him that is the approach it's not finishing him because a person has committed a crime that does not mean that uh, that send off all no the law actually demands that uh, the first attempt should be to see whether he can be reformed and brought back to the society as a responsible citizen who will not indulge in such crimes you spoke about the background of of the accused the circumstance of the crime what led to it and the law also recognizes that in bachan singh saying mitigating circumstances must be brought to the court but given the reality that a vast majority of death row prisoners are extremely poor we see that such information is rarely brought before the court because they don't have good representation then is this mandate of the law rendered meaningless uh, because of this interaction between poverty and very poor lawyering forget about what the courts have said in series of judgments after bachan singh 40 years ago look at a comprehensive study conducted by the law commission and which presented it uh, it's a 262nd report where they have referred to all these aspects they have analyzed 
and uh, reached a conclusion that the people who have been awarded the death penalty actually belong to a very poor financially, socially uh, poor background. So that is a reflection that they did not get the required legal assistance so as to present the mitigating factors before the court. So if you ask me, it's a fact. There's a systemic failure in extending the best available uh, legal assistance uh, to those uh, people. You also said that one of the approaches that the law must take is to assume that every person is capable of reformation. In that sense, that what you're advocating is for a strong presumption of reformation. And that would mean that there's a very high burden on the state to show that somebody cannot be reformed if you want to take their life. And do you see that happening in the cases at all? That, that there is any, in, in your experience, is there any meaningful discussion of reformation at all in our jurisprudence? I have hardly seen a judgment of any court where the state has made an effective effort to present before the court that uh, the, the accused is beyond uh, any reformation. It's a duty of the court to see and ask the prosecution also to establish that despite all these aggravating factors, even if the, the prosecution, the state, fails to present uh, the, all the aspects of a case, it is actually a duty cast on the court to ask the state, the prosecution, to establish that despite all the aggravating factors, is the accused beyond the possibility of a reformation. That is the one major concern the court has to address. We say proof beyond reasonable doubt in civil and uh, uh, absolute proof. Absolute proof for uh, arriving at a conclusion that this is the person and he is the only person and no other. So the standard of proof is much, much, much higher. But the degree of uh, the requirement for awarding a capital punishment uh, is much more according to me on the court. Have you ever seen a case where the court has made an attempt for a psychological evaluation of a, a person? Because there's a lot of um, psychological factors going into commission of a crime. Has there been any attempt on the part of a court in any of the cases which you have seen where the court has uh, asked the prosecution to conduct a psychological evaluation of uh, an accused which led to the commission of the crime and uh, which would also show whether the person is capable of reformation. Just as we have uh, physical, organic, systemic problems, so also there are mental factors going into the psychology of a person. A proper evaluation by a competent team of doctors would alone be in a position to assist the court as to whether a person is uh, capable of being reformed despite the commission of the crime which has already been established before the court. So the court's duty in that way, because the court is actually awarding an irreversible punishment. There is no point in repenting about it. There is no point in writing so many uh, theses about it after the, the person has been executed. It's, this is the only irreversible punishment. So keep that irreversible, irreversibility in mind and see whether Despite all that has happened, that the person is capable of reformation. And uh, that is a burden cast on the court. If the court does not get an assistance, then the court should elicit the assistance from the appropriate sources so as to reach an absolute conclusion that there is no scope at all in reforming the person and bringing him back to the society. Staying on the theme of reformation, I wanted to discuss with you the, the judgment of the Constitution Bench in Sriharan, which basically said that the High Court and the Supreme Court have the power to ensure that somebody can stay in prison for the rest of their natural life and that the courts can take away the remission powers of the state. So basically saying that the person will stay in prison for the rest of their natural life. 
do you really see a moral difference between the death penalty and that kind of uh, life imprisonment given this context of reformation well there's a lot of study need to be done on that aspect that penalty takes uh, the person away from this world whereas lifetime imprisonment takes away the person from his whole society his family his friends his relatives is actually denuded of everything in life except that he has a, he has a, that what you call a, a, some sort of a, a vegetation life in the prison as a number in prison not as a human person therefore it's not for the court to direct the state not to use its power of remission because remission power is to be seen and exercised by the state where they have a lot of evaluation done the court while ordering the punishment is not in a position to say as to whether the person has improved later his mental faculty his physical faculty his concepts his education his improvement and several aspects which go into the exercise of remission so the court cannot prejudge again it will be a wrong committed by the court saying that there is no scope for reformation so that he, let him be only in the jail no that is equally bad therefore in life punishment to be seen as for life the discretion should be left to the state to be exercised at the appropriate time but at the same it should be arbitrary also that is why the guiding principle supreme court said no such remission shall be uh, power of remission shall be exercised before a person completes 14 years so a minimum is actually ensured by the court so that uh, the, the 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 liberty given to the state should not the power should not be exercised arbitrarily so beyond that the jurisdiction power of the court and jurisdiction the jurisdiction of the state to make an impartial unbiased neutral assessment as to whether the person still needs to be continued in prison or he is far fitter than anybody else outside the prison to be sent back and integrated to the mainstream that should not be taken away court can say rigorous should be the method of evaluation or assessment that much caution the court can give but not absolute taking away no that's wrong once a person is in jail you must also see what reformative assistance is given to the accused in jail we condemn him and leave him there but we hardly take uh, any follow up action to reform him in jail the purpose of uh, uh, putting him in jail is to explore the possibility of reformation but he needs to be assisted so that also is systemic failure according to this also should be seen this particular aspect also needs to be seen while you assess Uh, in the matter of uh, remission by the state makes uh, uh, takes a decision for remission or not to give a remission i wish the judges of the superior courts also uh, make a periodic visits uh, in the jails across the country they will know the differences in the jails they will see the 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 approaches the the wardens have on the prisoners they will see the various reformative measures taken in the jail they will see how people would thirst and would really want to come back into life they will see the frustrated people they will they may be in a position to see on on their own the inhuman nature of uh, treatment sometimes given to them except there are so many things so once you actually have a, a, a an experience um by visiting a jail and spending some quality time there not to go and see but be in the jail for maybe a day in in and spending time with the uh, the convicts there without disclosing your identity because uh, if the identity is known then probably the prisoners may themselves uh, cook up stories sometimes they may try for uh, uh, what you call a illicit compassion there are so many other aspects also there security also there are so many things so they should incognito without disclosing the identity go and spend some quality time speaking to the prisoners speaking to the wardens speaking to the ngos working there so we will get lot 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 to learn from them i have had such experiences i have visited jails 
I have learned so many things from what is actually the ground reality in in a jail. Yes, Joseph, you were a judge for 18 years in the appellate courts and reflecting on that experience, how vulnerable do you think the Indian criminal justice system is to wrongful convictions? It's a fact that it is vulnerable. You might have read in the recent past, that's towards the end of my career, I had issued notice in a review petition and there was um, uh, a substantive special review petition also filed along with the open hearing on the review petition also. I was part of the bench. In fact, I was heading the bench. And um, the appeals were heard and they were all acquitted. They were all sentenced to death, confirmed by the High Court, confirmed by the Supreme Court. Luckily, they got a chance for um, filing a review and an opportunity to have the review heard in open court. Therefore, at the time of hearing this uh, review for admission, we found that there are substantial rights and defenses available to the person who has not even filed a special petition, who had reconciled it to his fate. Or probably he may not have had the further capacity to take things forward in Supreme Court because he might have, uh, 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 what do you call, fought his uh, legal rights maybe around 20 years. He might have been exhausted. His family might have exhausted. He might have given up. Comes to come, it is his fate. Ultimately, if you don't have the wherewithal, you will live up sometime. Even knowing fully well that you are innocent. So we give this liberty. So that shows system is vulnerable. No doubt about it. Do you think that the wide prevalence of custodial violence, custodial torture, uh, prosecutorial misconduct, uh, all of this makes it really a very dangerous criminal justice system in which to have the death penalty, especially given the irreversibility of the punishment. I am of the view that uh, this is high time the country should think as to whether it should be retained in the statute book. You have seen in certain criminal uh, penal statutes coming in that even the confession itself is treated as uh, uh, what you call the custodial confession. Custodial confession itself is treated as uh, an admissible evidence. So where does it go? Look, the, the way that the uh, Indian prosecution system, the custodial interrogation, several stories we have heard, we are reading the papers also, the way the police uh, interrogates a person. And uh, if in that process a person left without anything else, makes a statement or is, ma is made to give a statement. And if such a statement given, in custodial integration, interrogation made admissible and the court is statutorily bound to rely on it is quite unsafe. According to me, it is high time that we should, as a civilized society, as many countries have done in the, across the world, that we should, uh, it's time for us to rethink about retention of such a punishment in the statute book and uh, we should think of uh, appropriate other punishments than this. Justice Joseph, your partial dissent in Chanulal is in many ways a call to a more progressive uh, constitutional future, perhaps an opinion that is way ahead of its time. But now it's been 40 years since uh, the constitutionality of the death penalty was upheld in Bachan Singh. But sitting here today, how do you assess the constitutional future of the death penalty? Well, Chanulal is my judgment and the dissent was my <laughs> brothers. That's a different aspect. But I'm saying, I felt that after this is 40 years now, 40 years after the Bachan Singh, which uh, upheld the validity of uh, the death penalty. And uh, if you see down the line, 99% of the judgments rendered by the Supreme Court has in fact watered down the imposition of a death penalty. It's only very, very limited scope now left with the court in awarding the death penalty. While assessing the mitigating factors, the court has gone to the extent of saying that only if a court is convinced that this person, the accused, is beyond the reformation, then alone this can be awarded. And how do you arrive at such a conclusion? A judge 
who is a legally trained person unless he is assisted appropriately by the required uh, uh, assist, uh, by the required corners i say psychological social and so many other factors no as to there is absolutely no scope that there is a scope for reformation is itself uh, something to be seen in indian context because he has been swinging between death and uh, life for over 20 years and uh, if you assess the conduct of any death row convict in jails who have uh, spent about 10 or 15 years how reformed they have become in the process knowing fully well that they are going to be uh, executed so they never went uh, uh, as a lawless person they have been mild sober they pursued their education they showed signs of improvement they wanted uh, to come back to life they wanted to be of uh, civilized person so all these are signs of reformation couple of instances i have heard tired of being in jail people said better you execute and finish it that's a different uh, thing or to them that uh, absolute frustration in having spent about uh, uh, 10 to 20 years in jail does not mean that he is not capable of reformation he only said better living like this between life and death and uh, a, a life of no meaning better i <laughs> leave the world that's a cry of absolute frustration and that cry according to me is a cry for help to come back to life and be in society as in every suicide we say every suicide is a cry for help likewise this sort of a frustrated cry of a person better you finish me is a cry actually for help to come back to the mainstream of life just as joseph thank you so much for a very reflective and honest conversation with us today that has traversed the philosophical difficulties with the death penalty the difficulties of using it in a system like ours and highlighting some of the deep problems with the criminal justice system in india we really appreciate this conversation we would also like to thank our communications associate ruchi choudhury and podcast producer priya naresh assisted by hari om for making this podcast possible this is anup surendranath from project 39a at national law university delhi and we were in conversation with justice kurian joseph thank you for listening